You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Well, retail growth continues to be a trending topic, but the big question is, how have professional traders fared? Well, leading a discussion about the challenges and opportunities facing this important market, please welcome the head of derivative sales at Citadel Securities, Jason Relke, and their panelists, Jason Hedberg from UBS, Megan Dugan, NYSE, and Ariane Adams from SIBO Global Markets. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, and I appreciate you joining us here uh, this morning. We're excited about the panel. Um, before we get started, I don't think that Megan or Ariane need introductions. Most of the audience uh, know them, uh, but probably less familiar with Jason and, and myself. Uh, so, Jason, you want to take a couple minutes and let people know who you are? Sure, thank you. Uh, I'm Jason Hedberg. I run equity derivative sales at UBS. I've been in equity derivatives for 20 years, and uh, this is the first time I've come to this conference. Uh, it's enlightening because this is a side of the business that historically I haven't seen. Um, I think one of the things I hope to do today is, is bring a little bit of perspective of that side of the business that, that maybe many of you don't see. Excellent. Um, I, I thought it made sense to start the conversation to, to frame it a little bit, uh, pulling some of the slides we saw from Henry yesterday. Three in particular. Um, the first slide just talks about uh, what everybody has seen and we all know, the, the extreme growth in the options market. Um, obviously, retail is a, is a big proponent of this, but uh, we're going to talk a lot about uh, whether it's, it's been in the institutional market or not. Um, the second slide, which I think is, is interesting, is just the size of lot trades. Uh, if you look at this, you can see that towards the bottom, the, the blue and the red lines uh, uh, show you that block trades have actually decreased as opposed to increased uh, with the, the, the increase of the smaller lot sizes can be explained by a lot of things, um, you know, electronification of institution, institutional trading, uh, market makers who are actually at risk using the electronic market to recycle that risk, um, but it's something that we can certainly touch on. And then the third slide uh, shows the similar data just represented differently. Um, and as I said, this all obviously can be talked about uh, as the rise of the retail investor. But uh, what we're here to do uh, today is talk about uh, the challenges and opportunities facing the op institutional options market. Um, and, and those challenges and, and opportunities are, are certainly within uh, a lot of different aspects. And, and um, we'll, we'll dig right in. Let's uh, talk about the challenges first. Um, I think that uh, it makes sense to approach it from both the exchange side as well as the, the sell side uh, aspects. Um, Megan, when you're in conversation at the NYSE, uh, what are the most common challenges you hear regarding institutional participants? Like, what do you guys talk about? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, and it obviously evolves over time. Um, first and foremost, I would be remiss not to mention challenges as it relates to how everybody handled the COVID posture and operating posture of just sustaining and, and creating a marketplace with a time where we were all handling remote workforces. Uh, so, you know, that is a challenge that although we were able to surpass that, um, you know, and, and get through that, and we're seeing volumes come back to pre-pandemic levels, which is excellent, and we know that institutional options have now refound that, that space on the floor and the floor trade community. So operationally, that's an important space from an exchange operator perspective for both Ariane and I and, and the others in the audience. Uh, so 
challenges as it relates to operating posture is, is something that we are constantly evolving and changing with whatever's happening in the world. So that's number one. You know, number number two really is is around the um, ability to handle and process essentially any new products that are coming out of requests from larger institutional block size trades. Um, ability to support. Uh, Henry mentioned yesterday around the ability to um, handle new listings. So earlier this year and last year and in, in 2021, you know, we saw this record number of new listings. So that, as an exchange operator, we want to make sure we are able to go through our listings process and our set of our criteria to ensure that we're, we're providing products for the institutional trading community to trade on our markets. So there's a, a variety of things. I know we always listen in and go through the evolution of the process of outreach to our, our not only our flow brokers, but institutional uh, clients as well. Yeah, I feel like traditionally the institutional space, it's, and if you build it, they will come, as opposed to being at the forefront, um, you know, the, the amount of um, experience or, or uh, comfortability with whether it's flex or OTC, uh, the strike specificity, specificity different expirations, um, they use it when it's there, uh, but I, I don't know that they're at the forefront of it. So it's interesting to hear that you do get requests, uh, and, um, you know, uh, that's it's interesting. Thank you. Jason, from both UBS's perspective and uh, from your customer's perspective, um, what, what do you find both your institution and the customers themselves citing as challenges in our current market? Um, <clears throat> there's always challenges that evolve. I think a few years ago, um, or something that's been recurring is, is position limits. I mean, maybe many of the, <clears throat> the retail investors obviously never care about position limits. Institutional investors, there's not really a good rhyme or reason to how those things are set. Um, it's frustrating that they say, okay, you know, let me get this right. I can do this much listed. I can do that same amount, also OTC, and then an unlimited amount flex. And it doesn't really make any sense. And then you tell them, well, and if the puts and calls are the same way, it counts as double. So, you know, those are the little things that are, are kind of frustrating sometimes to institutional investors. I think... Um, you know, another thing when they come to me and they want me to provide liquidity and they ask me for a market to buy 10,000 and there's a thousand on the screen, uh, that subject to the tape footnote saying, I have to get this on the tape for it to, me to uphold my price. Um, that's a frustrating one as well. You know, anybody who trades cash is familiar with the stop and options, the stop doesn't really work. And we don't have a, you know, a good explanation. We've never really been able to address that. Um, and then I think most recently the challenges are around the reporting requirements. So everybody's talking about how transparency is better. For a lot of big accounts, they, you know, the transparency is just basically putting yourself out there um, with too much transparency in times of maybe distress or, or who knows. I think obviously the Reddit GameStop phenomenon was very high profile. It changed how people are trading listed options or how they're trading options. So I think those are three categories that I would cite. Thank you. Um, Ariane, uh, from an exchange and regulatory point of view, uh, how about anything that continues to keep institutional users in the OTC market versus doing it on listed exchange? Jason, OTC is a bad word for <laughs> exchanges. Come on now. We, we can't agree. Talk we about agree. That. All right, we thanks. can talk about that. Glad, glad we set the stage. Um, no, I, uh, I joke. Oh, excuse me here. It's pretty loud. I'll try not to talk as loud. Um, but OTC enlisted, you know, quite frankly, lives, quite, lives in harmony. Um, I think that they both serve a purpose in the, in the Lewis listed options marketplace. It's really telling in terms of why customers might use one versus the other. And I think they, it's appropriate um, to probably evaluate what is important from the OTC perspective and why it makes sense, um, because there are some critical reasons why. Um, and like I said, I think it's beneficial to the industry in general, um, but it also teaches us some lessons. So one, the obvious one, anonymity. Um, there is needs and requirements from an institutional perspective where they need and require a, a less of a footprint that that trade or the transaction needs to go up OTC. They might even not even necessarily have a, a securities account where that type of execution would need to be used from an OTC perspective. Next, I think that there are some functionality, some flexibility with OTC um, that allows a very complicated multiple leg um, exotic type of op options transaction to be put up 
in an, in, an, in an OTC format that might not necessarily be able to be replicated in a listed environment. And then lastly, um, hey, we're about to have 17 exchanges. Um, whether, you know, th that raises a lot of requirements, not only from an access, a messaging, a technology, compl it's complex. Um, and there might be some needs or re reasons and rationales why um, some users, some investors, might not take the steps to address that complexity, understand that complexity, and the ability for them to deploy capital and do a derivative, um, into any kind of derivative, might require them to use OTC. Okay, that's you know as much as I'll give you on the OTC front. We'll um, come back to it later. <laughs> don't worry. But I think Jason teed me up really well with regards to what the exchanges are doing. They're listening to that friction. And that's the part that frustrates us the most because I think the industry can really solve some of these things by really thinking thoughtfully about functionality and or some overhaul or oversights with regards to position limits. I was definitely going to talk about that, Jason, and I think that you said it well. That's a friction. That's, a, that's causing trades to go OTC, which could, quite frankly, be listed. Um, so how do we address that? I think that there is, for those who don't follow position limits as closely as many of us up here do, each one of these trades, and I look at Will Bartlett um, laughing at me, um, but, you know, look at limited number of um, contracts that an investor, an institutional investor can trade. I, one would say that these are antiquated levels, and maybe there's a more thoughtful way for the industry to think about these um, max cap um, position limits in maybe in notional terms rather than in max cap or hard contract limit terms. Um, we've gone down the path, as well as Megan has, to increase some of these limits for specific targeted ETFs, um, not necessarily the single stock equities at this point, but these are things that I think the industry can come together, work with the regulators to say, hey, I think there's a better way for them to um, monitor how big institutional footprint can be in the listed options marketplace. The other part um, um, Jason mentioned with regards to some of the friction is um, maybe some of the inefficiencies and in functionality with regards to um, trading options and um, versus um, in block format. Um, you need to get a concept of getting it up within an MBBO. There may be more we reasons and rationale whether there's a functionality enhancement that may need to be happen on exchange, on our exchanges, both Megan and ourselves, as well as NASDAQ's exchange, as well as Box's floor, um, to be able to get those trades, or those large trades got up quicker in a more effective way, to be able to incentivize the sell-side banks to be able to put those transactions up a little bit more effectively. Thank you. Um, this is a, a yes or no question. Uh, everyone obviously knows about the growth in the options world, and everybody talks about the, the retail investor being the, the reason for that. Uh, institutional investors over the past two years, has there been an increase in options usage, whether listed or OTC? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes, but overshadowed by our friends, the retail investors. Yeah, no doubt about yes it. Yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I talk too much. <laughs> do you think, uh, I'll jump the gun a little bit here. Jason, do you think that that is market-driven? Do you think it's, it's investor comfortability-driven? Or do you think it's um, a more broad type of, of um, you know, the defined outcome ETFs, a more broad type of user uh, coming into the marketplace? <clears throat> yeah, I think it's... Um... It's, it's probably driven a lot by the user demand, right? I mean, <clears throat> VIX kind of put volatility as an asset class um, and made it a household name. Suddenly, everybody was talking about VIX. Um, the idea that equity derivatives or derivatives were weapons of mass destruction is kind of a trope of a long time ago and a different type of investor, and people became... We can thank crypto for that. <laughs> you mean, so. I think people, too, became, um, you know... There was more demand from retail investors to say, what, what are you doing in your portfolio to add convexity or to hedge? How are we being more sophisticated with the implementation? You know, what are the other tools that are available, not just for you know, enhancing your portfolio, but maybe for market insights? So the level of awareness in, in equity derivatives has just grown incredibly, and I think you know, options there to tell a lot. So we see much more demand, I would say, particularly in, in the hedge fund and mutual fund space. Yeah. Um, to that end, Megan, uh, what types of advancements have, has uh, NYSE focused on to try and bring more block trades uh, to exchange? Yeah, so 
at NYSE, one of the things we've heard loud and clear was around, um, certainly from the institutional side, placement of large size orders, to your point. Um, and right, uh, roughly about a year and a half ago, we, we launched a newer product called All or None Cube on MX. So it's a price improvement auction that allows for 500 contracts or larger. So it incentivizes larger block size orders for that community. Um, and we've seen an increase in, in, in that usage for sure, certainly during the pandemic and, and after. Uh, so that was a, um, a, a helpful product to be able to listen and hear what's important for the institutions um, and provide you know another layer of flexibility of tools for their use uh, for exchange placement of larger block size trades. And are you getting enough responders to participate to make it a viable uh, mechanism? Yeah, our community, just like other exchange communities, like our communities of responders are very robust. Um, they're always hungry for uh, responding to uh, what's available on, on the price improvement side. So yeah, that's, it's a healthy environment. Um, and Ariane, uh, how does, uh, how do the exchanges, SIBO specifically or exchanges in general, um, keep up with the different types of asset managers out there uh, from the product or even, you know, execution mechanism point of view um, to, to evolve with the market? Yeah, no, I mean, Jason and Megan mentioned some of it, but listening, listening to our members is, is critical. Listening to their customers is critical. As we sit in the B2B2C model rather than the B2C model, maybe in my prior life I did. So hearing that feedback from Jason is extremely helpful to the exchanges to say, we need to answer their demand. We need to answer that they want to deploy more capital to this asset class in the capital markets, that's exciting. So how do we solve that? Um, we think thoughtfully about maybe, or we bucket how we think about that demand. Um, there's been a lot of demand around access. There's been a lot of demand around um, functionality. There's a lot of demand around efficiencies. So when I talk about access, um, uh, they want to trade options around the clock. I'm sorry to say that. Um, we've, we, we've witnessed it, and um, it's going to mean more hours for all of us. But um, the ability for us to enable SPX and VIX, be able to trade at 24-5 has resonated. It's been exciting. The, the Asia-Pacific region has gravitated toward. They want to see the ability or want the ability to access those products in their regular session. And even institutional asset managers here in the States want the ability to be able to um, react on geopolitical events that we've seen all too many times over the last quarter or two. Um, and they want the ability for um, the ability to be able to, to manage their risk in a more effective way because the, they actually have the products to trade it um, in the time zone that they want. Um, and then I think, you know, from an, from an efficiency perspective, um, you know, institutional investors have come to us and said, hey, listen, we have overriding strategies. We want to roll more, more quickly. We, wanna, we have, want daily rebalances that we need to hedge. Um, we can't be hedging just on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We want, would love to hedge on a, on a Tuesday, Thursday. Um, I'm not going to open the can of worms on single stock equities on Mondays and Wednesdays, but um, that being said, um, you know, adding Tuesdays and Thursdays has um, shown us that that desire and that need from an institutional perspective and even a retail perspective, although this is an institutional panel, has really shown us that that demand is there. And then lastly, on the functionality perspective, um, similarly, efficiencies, you know, Megan just had a great example with regards to what she's doing at New York um, and, and how we can add more fle flexibility and functionality to make the listed options market easier to tra transact. Um, we have a new floor opening in a, couple, in a couple weeks, and that actually is going to be state of the art, but that shows us that the block trading functionality is extremely critical to this ecosystem and the ability for customers to be able to use um, and want to also use that floor not in its current state, but maybe in its newer state, um, to really continue to ask for block liquidity in a more effective way is why we're really dedicated and, and um, want to continue to um, expend resources to enhance that type of execution quality, not to mention the electronic front. To the extent of 24-hour trading, and this is for any of the three of you, um, are the are the uh, the banks or the the market makers who are interacting with the institutions prepared and ready? Uh, it, it's obviously a multi-layered process. Like you know, Jason, are you guys doing work to be able to offer S and P liquidity 24 hours a day? 
<clears throat> we are. Um, I think one of the strengths of UBS is the, the global presence, right? A lot of people say global, but probably UBS is, is the best in terms of that balanced strength across Europe, U.S., and, and Asia. And it's a competitive advantage to be able to, to field orders from Asia overnight. So it, it's great what the exchanges are doing. The challenge for us so far has been that it's, it's manual in terms of how we handle it and who draws the short straw to stay up overnight for what's still a bit of a rare order coming through. So, you know, we're leveraging the team in Asia. Who we're using as the broker has been changing. Um, it's evolving, but I think it's important. I don't think it's going away. We'll continue to invest in how do we market this and develop it. Do you guys see it expanding beyond S&P and VIX into, into, you know, single stock options, something along those lines? I think we're far away away from there. Yeah. Um, if I put my previous hat on at the bank, I would I would echo your comments, Jason. Um, you know, I think the challenge is around even like regulatory oversight and, and making sure the folks that are picking up the phones operationally have licenses and so forth to be able to support that operationally. So workflows really matter for efficiencies to be able to make that further and maybe at a later point for multi-list. But I'm sure Arian has a better sense. Yeah, no, I think you you nailed it. I mean. Um, compliments and, and thanks to the industry for putting those resources or thinking about putting those resources towards this type of um, extended trading hours. Um, I think that everyone is in all capacities, market makers, brokers, um, customers are in different stages of adapting to this trading style. So some might have the functionality available to uh, trade around, follow the sun. Um, to have the um, trading facilities within the APAC region to be able to manage um, the start of the APAC day um, and then hand that book off. Um, some brokers also might have some functionality or tools that are utilized by others to be able to facilitate those trades while that other bank might be doing the work to be able to facilitate. It's all for the customer. Um, so if they continue to hear the customer demand, they're going to try to satisfy it. From, from an other, other products perspective, I think, you know, I think Megan is, is spot on on adding single stock equities. Um, I think the industry has a lot of work to do, especially obviously without an underlier to be able to hedge overnight. Um, that might be the first area where we might need to do a little bit more work. Yeah. I, I think that um, those single stocks will be very kind of the, the retail-driven high net worth maybe that comes out of other regions, um, and that'll probably all be automated. Our value add is still around S&P and VIX is going to be providing liquidity out of hours, and how do we do that you know, without having to have somebody always there if it's not always busy? Yeah. Um, going back to the dirty word, listed versus OTC. Uh, and and um, we all know there's an age-old battle to try and keep the large blocks on exchange. Um, Ariane, from uh, your perspective, Flex Options are coming up on their 30th anniversary. Um, they were originally introduced to, I, I think, to fight this specific battle, and now have gone in, a, in many different directions. And I would say the growth is coming from places that none of us even five years ago would have thought really uh, it would come from, which, it, which is great. Um, but to its original goal of trying to have institutions adopted for the customizing of, uh, obviously, all of, the, all of the components of the option, has it succeeded? And, uh, and if not, Oh, if yes, great. We could we could move to the next question. Uh, if not, uh, what what can be done to to help it evolve? I don't answer questions quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, that being said, no, I didn't even know it was thirty years, but that's remarkable. It's been a wonderful product for the industry. We I think all exchanges have put a lot of time and, and effort into this one. Again, speaking back to the dirty word, um, that we'd love to make um, you know more products be able to be traded listed. So how do we do that? We have to put more functionality and more brain power by making the product a little bit more efficient. Um, and I think that, Jason, you mentioned it, I think we've seen the traction and acceleration of growth more recently, probably since about 18. Uh, and I'm going to look at some stats here because I know Henry mentioned some of them. But, you know, we're witnessing, obviously, from a volume, uh, open interest perspective, not to mention the growth in um, defined outcome. I think... Um, uh, uh, it was mentioned yesterday in terms of the growth of the defined outcome. I can't remember which panel it was with regards to AUM and then the indices attributed to these defined outcome strategies. But Henry showed a great slide yesterday that I wanted to reflect on and that ADV has grown from 94K in 2018 to 
over 300,000 contracts of ADV um, in this first quarter of this year. Open interest has grown 90% um, from 2018 to 2021, and single stock option volumes are 80% of that volume. So that might even speak to Jason's point of some of the friction in the position limits. Hey, we're going to do it in listed. We're going to put that trade up also in OTC, and then, hey, we're going to use flex to also maybe expand or to deploy more capital to that strategy. So one of the contributing factors, as I mentioned, is, is this defined outcome space. So what are they using in the wrapper? They're using these flexible flex products to be able to customize um, this structured product, which has historically been an institutional product or maybe a high net worth product, and bring it to the retail community. Bringing those ETFs to market has been really successful, and it's these types of unit trusts variable annuity trusts that use flex options to be able to create a structure that comes mainstream. Um, so that this has definitely been um, a pretty exciting area. The one area where we're seeing or getting requests from the insurance community, insurance communities have a need for um, pers- more precise notional dollar amounts that they need to hedge on a daily basis or more frequent. And they've asked us to make a one multiplier in flex. So coming at the end of the second quarter, we're going to take flex options, which is traditionally a 100 multiplier, make it one um, in an effort to allow them to maybe ex- execute or hedge parts of their um, uh, hedging, um, excuse me, or their exposure with a more defined or precise instrument. So, Jason, great question. We're super excited for this one. This is where we see some growth in the industry. And in the securities finance side of things, Revcon's obviously on the single side. It, it's exploded there as well. And I think that probably uh, just continues to, to um, trend to upwards as well. Um, specific, uh, Jason, you and I have uh, in our careers seen a credit crisis, a flash crash, and a major counterparty go bankrupt, so, for whom I worked at the time. Um, <laughs> I thought it was the one I worked for. <laughs> <laughs> if none of these uh, have moved institutions into centrally cleared product, and everyone has a short memory, and we see it uh, Quickly, uh, you know, everybody wants to go listed, flip to listed, flip to listed. Um, but then, sure enough, you, you give it three years and it goes back to OTC. Um, there's still a, a massive amount of, of, of trading that occurs, whether it's in the SPX or in single-name options in the over-the-counter market. Is there anything that brings people into, you know, is it, is it you know, uh, larger PIM or more responders, price improvement, lack of ability to improve on a price in an OTC trade? Like, is there anything that you think that can bring institutions back to the listed market? Yeah, I think uh, that, you know, what I started with, some of those things are on how do we provide some anonymity? I mean, talking about flex options, you mentioned that flex is a little bit more anonymous than, than listed, right? It's, you have to go looking for it as opposed to just, you know, watching the block trade recap. Um, but then, you know, a hedge fund will ask you, okay, if I'm going to do this flex, does that mean we just change the strike by a penny? And you kind of wonder, like, are we trying to circumvent something that's a rule if we're making these little adjustments? And, you know, it's, it's a gray area that, honestly, I feel like we always want to err on the side of caution and what's the spirit of the law in addition to the, you know, the letter of the law. Um, so there's still a lot that's so gray in options that I think is one reason why sometimes OTC is cleaner. Mm-hmm. Um, because, again, like we could talk about OTC to listed flips. We could talk about the bust and adjust. There's good reasons maybe why some of these things have been put in place. But a lot of our investors, and I would say even the banks, don't fully appreciate, like, why do we create that? So uh, unless we can come up with some reasons to say, how do we give, you know, um, a more anonymous outlet for oversized trades, right, which everybody is kind of out there looking for, you know what's going to happen, you know what the dealer is going to do, you know. I mean, it's if you see something that went from a low delta to a high delta, you know exactly what the dealer is doing, and we're all, you know, aware of it. And the customer may not always love it. So, um I think you'd have to address that. I'd have to address some of the vagaries in, in the listed market, which still I don't think we have a good explanation for. Yeah. Um, switching gears a bit, uh, let's talk about um, best X and the term EQ. Um, you know, speaking frankly, until I worked at Citadel Securities, I didn't have any idea what the term EQ was. Um, everybody in this room is probably very familiar with the term EQ. Um, people think in the institutional market that price competition means the best price of X number of dealers proves to someone that that is the best execution. Uh, I, I, th- I would argue that that's absolutely not the case. 
but it's, it satisfied uh, somebody's kind of regulatory board, if you will. Um, uh, Megan, how do we incorporate EQ into the institutional uh, space? Um, I think in the, in the cash equities world, uh, the term captured spread is used, and people are familiar with that. Um, are, are, is, it, is it our job to educate people and just adopt the term EQ? Is it, do we, is it, is it truly just education and, and reporting of some kind? Like, how do we get the, the best X away from best price and actually into a best X conversation? Can I ask, by the way, what is EQ? You guys can explain it better than I can. Extinction quality. Yeah, well, it's not like emotional quotient or something. Like, I'm very sensitive to everyone's needs here. <laughs> we as options industry are very emotional. You know, we're very sensitive people. So, yes, you know, uh, it's execution quality. So it's a very clear-cut metric that the retail community utilizes with the aggregators to be able to be able to understand where within the spread that, that option price traded. Um, and, and yesterday, Ovi was mentioned on, on the panel that you know that these things were stats that they were able to provide on a quarterly basis and a monthly, now to a daily. Um, and they have an end-of-day sort of like broker card, too, like how did you do, right? So it's a sort of a report card of ability of providing great execution. And they were, will do the same for the other aggregators, so they measure them back and forth, right? Um, Institutional options, a completely different ballgame. I will be completely honest and say I don't have the full answer. I don't think anybody here has the full answer just yet, but I think as an industry, we collaboratively... Citadel Securities is working on it. <laughs> yes. I think <laughs> collaboratively... Give me the answer when you come up with it. <laughs> collaboratively, we can collectively come together with what we feel like it. In my view, there's sort of three parts to this. One... One is that we have the ability to have better toolkits. And I know, uh, Jason, we talked about this a little bit before, and, and Annabelle mentioned it yesterday. Having more analytics at the point of looking at putting a trade on the tape and having better clear clarity with, should this be going down into an, an electronic auction? Should we be doing a sweep and then you know a price improvement piece? Or should we be just contacting your floor broker to be able to put up the trade? You know, Those decision trees have a, a variety of different outcomes, but the important thing is being more clear or understanding at the point of trading, having that analytical toolkit is a really useful and important one. And that only is going to get better with enhanced analytics that we're all seeing and, and developing across the industry. So I think that's the first area. Um, from an execution quality standpoint, nobody's ever going to give uh, floor broker A versus floor broker B you know, the same order at the same time at the same uh, moment. So you never have apples to apples comparison here. So it's, it's a very difficult uh, you know, area to be able to fully adjust and, and understand. Um, from a capture standpoint, the third side, you know. That also is has some challenges to it, whereby you have to look at the listed market and the depth of the listed market, and you can understand somewhere within that you know you're looking to go through. But it's it's a very difficult thing to be able to provide. Um, I I believe you know the research and analytics that the institutional community has and continues to have and utilize um, pr provides a them a different set of skills and capabilities than the retail communities. You know, retail traders do not typically have in-house research reports with in-house research staff at their beck and call, mm -hmm. um, where institutional side they do, or they have relationships with folks that have that, the banks that, that have those. So it's a, it's definitely a different community set. Uh, I think, like I said, collaboratively, we as an industry could easily come together with an understanding of providing more qualitative metrics to be able to provide um, an execution capability for institutional options. And finding some of the, the liquidity that is not in a lit market. I mean, we all see the screens, but um, we also know if you launch an auction, there are responders, and there may be price improvement there. Um, we saw during COVID uh, that the exchange floors physically can close, and there was zero disruption, and yeah. credit to, to um, all the exchanges for, for being able to provide that. Um, Ariane, does it lend itself to the conversation that you know open outcry is an antiquated uh, mechanism of, of trading options? Like, should should it should even to prove best X and all those types of things? Should it all be electronic? Yeah, no, it's a good question, and I think to get to the answer to that question, because I'm long-winded, but to get to the answer to that question, I think you probably want to go to that point, a pivot point, where we talked about when. Um, the world experienced COVID and we went work from home and everyone, not just the exchanges, everyone in this room had to get really smart about having, trading out of your bedroom, but also trading, um, um, you know, taking a block order and making it electronic. 
Um, and I think, like, what, what, you know, what did that cause? It would cause the need, a willingness, an ability to be able to transact some orders, some temporary, some permanent, um, in an electronic fashion, all, you know, possible trades that we see on a daily basis today now that the floors are reopened. So what did we learn? We did learn that some trades can and will stay electronic. Um, the numbers show it, and that some of that flow has gotten smart enough to be able to trade a lot of that flow in an electronic capacity. But that, what else did it show? It showed us that actually that there are still trades, large, capitally intensive, complex transactions that still need any one of the floors on exchanges to be able to print a transaction. It could be legs. It could be complexities. It could be um, the need for more um, facilitation and liquidity providers to interact with that business. So, you know, there is kind of like, so what did the exchange do about it? Where are we today? Um, you know, pinpointing, you know, clearly on the open outcry side, um, all of the main exchange operators have, most of the main exchange operators do and will continue to be um, maintaining the floor um, and their presence. We all still feel that it is a valuable component to the ecosystem and how trades go up on exchange. Um, and I think that, but there is probably a need and a willingness to, to evolve some of the rules and requirements on maybe some more efficiencies, and I'll get to that in a second. But on the electronic side, I think that um, we learned a lot during that process on um, maybe during the time when COVID was hit, there was a need for um, New York, NASDAQ, to SIBO, um, to ask for forgiveness from the SEC on certain rules be able to allow for the electronification of those block trades. That caused us to understand how trades could be executed more effectively um, during that time, and that now has made us smarter in this, in this area. I think that um, some things that probably need to be more efficient on, and Jason talked about it earlier, is the, is the ability to trade an, an index um, with a combo or synthetic combo um, rather than a future. Um, there is still um, inefficiencies, even though it is, might be cross SRO or cross um, regulatory body on how those trades get executed. But there is a need and a willingness and an ask of the exchanges to create that cross-asset spread functionality. And it's one area that we're focused on developing to make it uh, the electronic block market be more efficient um, and be able to be executed electronically, not taking away or discounting what the open outcry um, component does to the ecosystem as well. I mean, I, I'll jump in on this just because I think best X is one of the toughest challenges we face of how do you prove it? I know everybody I work with is, is honest and forthright, wants to do what's best for the customer. But then if you're asked to prove it, right, well, how do we prove these things? And, you know, it's tough, too, because a lot of people have interpreted best execution equals price, right? Like it's the one thing that's clear. The value of a dollar is a dollar. But if I have a customer that comes to me and wants me to provide liquidity on 10000 and I give him a price, he's not going to be happy if I'm trying to work this better and I get a penny better on half the size. You know? And we've been queried before you know, by to say, like, well, you were finding the price better. Why did you guys put up the rest, right? Like, why did you just put it up? Because the risk is if we can't get that on the tape, the customer is, is not happy with that. And that best execution is unique to every single customer's want. So, I mean, in some ways, we've taken the approach to say, does the salesperson and the trader understand what the customer's priorities are, and are you representing that for best execution? But the idea of the analytics that we try to put around it to prove it is so difficult. Yeah, it's tricky. Yeah. It's tricky. Um, with respect to an actual trading experience, uh, we know that the ease of picking up your phone and pressing a button has made it super easy to trade options for the retail investor. Um, that hasn't gotten to the institutional space yet. Um, you know, whether it's zero commissions or trading from your phone, um, Jason, do you think that there's a world where the, the ease of the, the, the process, right now the process for an institutional investor to get block liquidity is pick up the phone, talk to their sales trader, sales trader talks to trader, trader makes price, Customer says yes or no, goes to the floor, goes into a pit. Like, so there's so many hops along the way. Um, is, there, is there a natural or is there some sort of efficiency we can create in that process to make the end user experience better? Um, I guess that, that's the question. Yeah, I, so I think you know, the same way the pandemic created um, a shift that will last a, a long time in terms of how people work, I think the SIBO shutting the floor 
it, it changed everything when that happened, right? Like somebody that typically called up and asked for liquidity and found that when markets were so volatile, suddenly people who'd never traded electronically before were, you know, they realized like it's, it's not a bad way to seek out liquidity. And I can keep my finger on, you know, the, the trigger of, of executing this trade myself. So I would still say, you know, it's a small but rising percent of our volume. There's a reason UBS is investing in it heavily. Um, you know, Dina Thakarar, who joined the team this year, in addition to a couple other people, it's going to be a complement to our high-touch business. And I'm personally taking the lessons of how, like, the cash market evolved, or even FX, where they kind of had the high-touch guys over on one side and the low-touch guys were working on different product. I think that, you know, any institutional account I have that normally would call me up, I'm also trying to arm them with that ability to trade electronically quicker, easier. There's just a need for, for both of those, like, uh, you know, those channels. Yeah. How about from the exchange perspective, either of you? I had one comment just to add on, because a lot of what you mentioned is very much around simplicity, around complete communication, clear mm -hmm communication along all of those hops, right? Um, one area that we've been focused on is at, at NYSE and ICE. ICE chat is available on and a, has a very large footprint across our community and is well utilized by the upstairs and IDB community as well as uh, desks. We're rolling out with our pillar platform in July, essentially an open architecture plan for our trading floors as well as a, you know electronic uh, platform uh, transition to be able to allow essentially you know, conversations and communication to be able to, to transverse from ice chat into the floor brokers workstation. So being able to just eliminate one last hop in that in that piece and eliminating you know any potential concerns for mis, you know misunderstandings is is an area to be able to just make the entire process more efficient uh, because it's it's an important part of how you know, the entire ecosystem will work. So that area is, is an area where we're we're certainly focused on and, and we'll see a helpful need. I think overall from an ancillary standpoint. Can you do away with the 2FA authentication email or is that here <laughs> no, to stay? No, that's here to All stay. All right, good, good, good. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Ariane, uh, anything to add there? No, just building upon what Jason and, and Megan have said, I think it came out in a couple different parts of the conversation today with regards to the institutional probably wanting the complement. They need the execution and the block and the hand-holding and the liquidity providers, up, whether that's upstairs and on the facilitation desk. Um, but they're asking many questions of all of us about how to get smarter about electronic trading, how to get smarter about algos, how to get smarter about even low latency connectivities and systematic trading. Um, but there seems to be um, a need for both. Um, and that also stems from um, making sure that we have inefficient um, exchanges and technology that stood up for um, them to have a great experience and to continue to prove it. So tools that, on, that speak to BestX, um, sadly CAT, and then also the execution quality um, really will continue to build and these, um, that we have these users and then they continue to deploy more capital um, into derivatives in particular. I think the last thing I'll mention, I think, Jason, that you and you asked us of what else are we focused on. Um, there's a lot of, we have, uh, tend to have a lot of um, topics that tend to happen in the market structure, but with regards to capital inefficiencies, it tends to be a pain point for all of us, all of us in this room, whether it's market makers, liquidity buyers, broker dealers, and, and especially customers on the institutional side with regards to offsets and portfolio margining treatment with regards to derivatives. I could probably talk for about a half an hour, and I won't on that topic, but it's one that I think we all continue to be advocates for um, so that there can be more efficient ways of utilization of capital with not punitive charges from a capital perspective. Yeah. Well, thank you guys very much. Um, I think a, a great panel, and obviously we're around if anybody wants to follow up. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider.
Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.